The alleged assassination of Jumonville was the match that ignited a war that would continue for five years in America, seven years on the world stage. The war finally turned in favor of the British at a 1759 battle for the fortress city of Quebec, located strategically on high cliffs above the wide St. Lawrence River. Whoever controlled Quebec controlled the St. Lawrence, and whoever controlled the St. Lawrence controlled the interior of Canada. Here, nearly 5,000 British met over 4,000 French soldiers. British General James Wolfe lost his life, but won the battle. Canada became a British possession, and France all but withdrew from North America. Once this threat to their well-being was removed, then the colonists began to think, well, do we really need to be run by this pipsqueak island off the coast of Europe? Uh, they began to see themselves as the true possessors of this vast continent. And the seeds of the American Revolution were sown in this uh, route of the French. But the British saw it another way. They had fought a war defending the American colonies that had left the British Treasury with a crushing debt. The colonies would have to pay their fair share. The Americans had plenty of money and they paid practically no taxes. British taxes on America cost the average American a dollar twenty a year. And most of these were invisible taxes paid on imports. The British had a, a, a national debt of over 150 million pounds. And there was constant talk in London about the whole country going bankrupt. Their taxes were 25 times higher than the Americans. So they were not particularly uh, impressed when the Americans screamed uh, that you can't tax us. With a population of over 20,000 in the 1760s, the thriving New England port of Boston was, after Philadelphia, the second largest city in America. Here, political radicals known as Whigs or Patriots first felt the burden of British taxation and resisted it. As early as 1760, a Boston lawyer and political theorist named James Otis saw the seeds of tyranny in arbitrarily imposed taxes. There is a man who is forgotten, and he's more important than any of them, at least as far as the way that the revolution started, and that's James Otis. It was his writings which were the inspiration for Sam Adams, John Adams, John Hancock, and indeed all the others. Otis was the mind behind it, that Sam Adams was the mouth. Samuel Adams was a radical by nature. He saw tyranny coming through the windows in all directions. And he really became the closest thing we had to a professional revolutionary. He did nothing really much else to support himself in Boston except agitate. Early taxes like the Sugar Act affected only wealthy shippers and distillers. But in 1765, the Stamp Act affected everyone by mandating that a stamp purchased from the British government be embossed on all legal documents and newspapers. Sam Adams used the growing opposition to Britain's new laws to organize a political action group named the Sons of Liberty. In Boston and throughout the colonies, the Tories, or Loyalists, saw things differently than Sam Adams and his Patriot companions. They often wanted their relationship with England to change too, but they wanted peaceful change, and above all, they wanted to remain within the confines of the British Empire. John Adams divided the population up into thirds. He said a third were for the revolution, a third were opposed, a third were neutral. The Loyalists thought people like Samuel Adams, the Sons of Liberty, were demagogues who were ambitious people, who wanted to make it to the top, 
of the political or the economic ladder who had self-interested motives and who were very cunning. They often use the word, a variation of the word cunning to describe the patriot leaders. For loyalists like Massachusetts Governor Thomas Hutchinson, whose three-story home was destroyed by patriots in 1765, the Sons of Liberty weren't noble idealists. They were a mob. They call me a brainless Tory. But tell me, which is better? To be ruled by one tyrant 3,000 miles away, or by 3,000 tyrants not a mile away? Mather Barnes, Boston Wales. One common way of dealing with loyalists was to put hot tar on their bodies and um, put chicken feathers on top of the hot tar and take the person in the cart up and down Main Street so that everybody in the community could show their disdain for these people. Britain, secure in her mind, refused to be intimidated by her upstart colonists. She would tax as she pleased, and her colonies would behave and pay. The colonies are not to be emancipated from their dependence on the supremacy of England. George the Third. George III was certainly not a tyrant. He was devoted to the constitution as the British knew it, to a constitutional monarchy, parliamentary monarchy. The Americans were challenging the British constitution, which was, in British eyes, the only constitution in the world, the only parliamentary constitution, the only constitution of free men. The king relied on his ministers, especially his prime minister, Lord Frederick North. Upon my word, if we are to run after America in search of reconciliation, I do not know a single act of parliament that will remain. Lord Frederick North. To protect their tax collectors and government officials from mobs like the Sons of Liberty, Britain began to quarter permanent troops in Boston. Their presence led to the events sensationalized in this engraving by Paul Revere. His friend Sam Adams fully exploited the event in his propagandistic writings, referring to it as the Boston Massacre. It was a cold March night in 1770. A lone British sentry held his post on King Street. Bands of citizens were on the streets, angry after a minor confrontation with another soldier earlier in the day. A mob began to form, the sentry the target of their anger. Nearby, Captain Thomas Preston marched his guards to the sentry's side. The mob began to throw snowballs, chunks of ice at the British soldiers. One fell, and his musket fired in the air. Preston shouted to his men to hold their fire, but he was too late. His frightened, angry men fired into the crowd. Five citizens died including Crispus Attucks, a former slave. Sam Adams demanded that the soldiers be tried for murder and that all British troops be removed from Boston. Governor Hutchinson, fearing rioting, ordered the troops removed from the city proper. Later in the year, the soldiers from the massacre were tried. They were defended by three men, including one of the finest lawyers in Boston, a patriot, Sam Adams' cousin, John Adams. Facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes, our inclinations, or the dictates of our passions, they cannot alter the state of facts and evidence. John Adams at the massacre trials. All but two of the soldiers were acquitted. Those two were court-martialed and then dismissed from the service. 
with his Boston Massacre hysteria.